Hello, everyone. My name is Beatrice Mukantabana from Veritas, and I'm here to moderate the session. Please open up the chat window for questions or comments. We will have time for Q&A at the end of the session. Now let's hear about how to migrate virtual workloads to AWS using Aptar and NetBackup resiliency. With us today, we have Joe D'Angelo, Availability Practice Lead and Distinguished Engineer at Veritas. We also have Rich Rose, Senior Distinguished Architect, also known as Dr. Aptar at Veritas. And we have Henry Axelrod, Principal Partner Solution Architect at AWS. Joe, please take it away. Thank you for that introduction, Beatrice. Um, I just want to begin by saying how thrilled I am to be here speaking with you, our customers and partners at Conquer the Cloud. Uh, my name is Joe D'Angelo, and as the availability practice lead, I've had the unique fortune of being able to converse with a wide array of our end user community. And so it's with that experience that I want to share with you the approach that we at Veritas have developed to ensure a more efficient and expedient process for migrating workloads to the public cloud. So like any good methodology, you should always begin with assessing your situation. Know before you go, as I like to say. And with Aptar, our analytics solution, you will indeed have a solid basis for which you can begin your cloud migration journey. After which, you'll want to have a strong foundation for which you can orchestrate, and in some cases, directly execute that migration process itself. And that is where the resiliency platform comes into play. We'll demonstrate a little later on in this session on how that will actually work. If, however, tier one applications are your priority, with InfoScale, you will have the flexibility to move your services at a moment's notice to the public cloud and off with often negligible disruption to your SLAs. And this actually includes Heritage Unix environments as well. And from there, NetBackup can serve not only as the core of your data protection in the public cloud, but as the underlying mechanism for seeding new instances, as well, whether it be Windows or Linux. And finally, we want to ensure you're able to maintain the overall process, process efficiency. And so we finish where we started with Aptar Analytics and its review capabilities. So to that end, I want to welcome to the session my esteemed colleague, Senior Distinguished Architect Rich Rose, to take you through Aptar's cloud assessment capabilities. Rich, floor is yours. Thanks, Joe. Um, we've got a lot of customers that have large on-prem environments right now, and they've been tasked and asked uh, by their management to say, you know, we need to get a third of our environment moved to the cloud in the next six months. And, you know, it's a pretty daunting task because they don't really have a lot of the correct information to work with. Uh, they might have, so, you know, tools in place, uh, but they don't really have the kind of the analytics that can help them with their journey. So we, uh, with Aptar, uh, will will be basically our main core competencies around uh, chargeback and uh, and cost reduction and risk mitigation. But uh, one of the things that we've done with the, the information that we were able to gather from all these different sources is be able to now uh, help customers figure out, you know, how can I right size my, my cloud journey? So we've got an example here of a report that we've done that um, really this is kind of a, a standard thing that we've always done that Aptar has always been able to do, which is basically looking at your on-prem environment and in this case, we're looking at the memory statistics of various VM guests. This is just a report that we've had for years. Uh, we gather data from your VMware environment. We can now look at uh, not only how many vCPUs are configured and how much memory is being uh, it has allocated to it, but also what its consumption and usage was over a period of time. And so with that information, uh, customers used to use that for various things. And now we could take that same information and actually use it to help with the cloud migration. Um, if you notice on this guy, it has a bunch of CPUs configured, but it hasn't really used all that much over that course of time. So um, we then take that information and say, all right, uh, how would that look then if we were to take that system and, and lift and shift it to the cloud? So we've got systems here that have, um, you know, certain amount of vCPUs configured and a certain amount of memory that's configured to them. If you just took those as they were configured in vCenter uh, and lifted and shifted them to the cloud, uh, those systems would translate into uh, AWS terminology. In this case, you've got everything from uh, M4 16 extra large or you know 
T3s, various uh, size instances that might be uh, appropriate for that many vCPUs and that much memory. However, uh, we've determined uh, that because those systems are really not using all their vCPU and all of the memory that they have allocated to them because we've been metering that, and we also know how many hours they've been running, we can make recommendations that's based on your actual usage as to what uh, we would recommend that that would be appropriate for the cloud migration. And as you notice, we're also incorporating the costs in there. So you can see that there's a significant cost savings. Uh, if we just took it as it was configured and moved it, lifted and shifted it, it would cost a lot more than the actual recommended size would actually be. And that's a huge savings. <laughs> Uh, a lot of our customers are seeing just massive uh, amounts of savings when they start analyzing it. And again, as I mentioned before, they don't have a lot of tools that can actually provide this, and we can do this out of the box and provide that you know, almost immediately and be able to help uh, with that. I'm going to hand it back to Joe now. So now if you imagine we've, we've kind of narrowed down the systems that we want to move to the cloud, uh, we've got them right-sized, now what? How do we get them there? Th thanks, Rich. Um, so to your point, now that we have seen how Aptar can help you make your journey to the cloud more cost effective, um, I want to spend a few minutes discussing with you our resiliency strategy and how Veritas is addressing the needs of your most critical workloads in the public cloud. Uh, but before I do that, I want to welcome to our session Henry Axelrod, AWS Partner Solutions Architect, and just an all-around wealth of knowledge uh, regarding cloud storage and resiliency. Uh, Henry, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Joe. Nice to be here. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so Henry, you know, you've had a lot of experiences working with Veritas. Um, can you perhaps share with our audience some of the challenges you've heard from our joint customers about their plans and in many cases struggles when considering their options for migrating as well as protecting workloads in, uh, in AWS? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, obviously I talked to a lot of customers uh, as storage is a huge part of almost any enterprise or really customer, big or small. And, uh, you know, a lot of uh, what we hear for our customers and even what we hear in general at AWS is customers are looking for ways to uh, migrate. They want to know how to get started. How do they tie in? How does the cloud come in and, uh, and what tools are available to them? So I think as we started looking at, you you know, uh, at the Veritas portfolio, one thing that customers really like is the fact that you kind of can handle their data and throughout the entire life cycle, you know, whether they're uh, uh, fully migrating, whether they're running in a hybrid environment and uh, whatever their needs are from their, you know, most mission critical applications, you know, all the way down uh, to, you know, their development and test environments and be able to, you uh, seamlessly move those uh, from on-premises to an AWS uh, environment and continue to protect those with the level of availability that the customers really demand. And, you know, as they're moving to uh, cloud, it's often a question of, you know, what what is provided for them on the platform versus what uh, they're, they're able to, uh, you know, to do and replicate what they might be doing today on-premises. And I think, you know, the Veritas tool set is able to really come and, and help bridge that gap for customers. Well, that, that is no surprise because we're hearing the exact same challenges. And thank you for those insights, Henry. Um, you know, you know, day in and day out. So that is why we have developed a resiliency strategy that's intended to ensure that not only your data is protected in the cloud, but your applications are resilient. Um, but moreover, the experience you have with managing the two are consistent, you know, whether that's on-prem uh, and AWS or between physical and virtual environments. You know, you know, taking that all into account, Henry, how much stock do you see customers putting in having a consistent on-prem and public cloud experience when it comes to, you know, managing critical applications and storage? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's hugely important for our customers and anyone who's been around backups for long enough knows the kind of ultimate, uh, you know, achievement in backups is a single pane of glass, right? Uh, it, which is being able to see your whole environment, understand uh, your environment, have a single tool set um, 
you know, to manage customers often one of the reasons uh, we've seen some customers be hesitant to, um, you know, to make that leap towards cloud is, you know, am I going to have a fractured tool set? Am I going to have something that I have to do differently on prem and uh, differently on the cloud where I need multiple different teams and I need to figure out what my new strategy is going to be? And it creates a lot of management and other complex overhead if uh, if customers have to think of using two different tool sets uh, to manage their environment and get uh, especially customers that need things like reporting right uh, hu hugely important to be able to uh, look across both environments as as I said customers also run uh, often in hybrid uh, type setups so there could be you know long-term uh, need to be able to look across on-premises and their uh, AWS cloud environment. Yeah, that that's that's it's fantastic to hear that because that is again you know the same conversations that we're having the same challenges that we see customers faced with, um, and that is why we're so keen on having a platform, the resiliency platform, as a way to orchestrate across all those different ecosystems. So why don't we now take a few minutes to kind of dive into a demonstration of the Veritas resiliency platform, uh, more specifically, how it can help you accelerate cloud adoption while leveraging net backup MSDPC. Um, and at the same time, uh, look out for in there uh, in this process, how uh, we're able to benefit from those previous reports that uh, the Aptar solution was able to show us. So this is a demonstration of the VRP dashboard. And what we have here is our global view into the, the console. And we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the unmanaged assets. These are ones that we've discovered but aren't actually applying any kind of uh, recovery plan or policy to. Uh, we're going to go ahead and select a particular workload here. It's a Windows guest. We can see that we've discovered that actually already has a net backup recovery policy assigned to it. Go ahead and select that particular uh, virtual machine. Uh, and we go ahead and we apply a, a service objective to it. In this case, this is going to be utilizing net backup MSDPC as a way to do remote recoveries. We see that we have the target data center. is going to be an AWS. We see the on-premises of the conquer, the conquer Every Cloud data center. Um, from here, we go ahead and we're going to define the availability zone that it's going to be in. And we're also going to be able to select that version of the instance type. And that's directly derived from the reports that we were able to achieve in Aptar. So we can now select an appropriate uh, or more um, modest instance, uh, depending on what uh, was needed. Uh, we select some default values for the, for the AWS EC2 environment. Uh, and here we actually can uh, establish the specific subnet mappings and IP addresses. Um, so really, a lot of the customization or personalization that's needed to move a workload that existed on-prem can all be programmatically included in the process with VRP. So whether it's the, the type of instance that's going to be instantiated or the network identification, all of that is um, part of this workflow. We go ahead and we can click next. We're going to go ahead and give this resiliency group a name. This is just an arbitrary name that we give it to uh, for the purposes of, of organization. Um, call it Win2019 MSDPC. I'm going to go ahead and click Submit. Now, from here, um, it's going to be the process of establishing that, re that uh, resiliency group. And some of the processes or procedures that are being performed in the background are ensuring that I can authenticate to that particular virtual machine such that it can update any IP address information. Um, it's right now in the configuring state. It's going to take a few minutes here to, to go through and, and complete all of that. The goal of which being giving you the opportunity to use net backup in this case as the data mover, right? So we've established the net backup configuration already. That's that would be sort of the uh, a precursor to this or a preamble to this configuration, establishing that uh, that um, uh, deduplicated image uh, in a cloud bucket uh, using uh, using S3. Now, once it goes through this process, we can um, uh, we'll see the different steps that are being performed. Um, now, Henry, let me, let me throw it back to you real quickly here. Uh, you know, how often do you hear customers struggling to do these kinds of steps manually? Yeah, so I, I definitely um, we encounter many customers who try and you know put their own kind of tool sets or scripting or things together, which you know which uh, do work, but uh, they create complexities at scale. And I think that's where, um, you know, where uh, VRP and NetBack have really kind of come in as we see customers try to do this, you know, they may, uh, you know, do some conversions or other things for one or two machines, right? But as they start getting into, you know, the uh, the hundreds or thousands of machines, that that's where they, they really start, um, you know, running, running into uh, some complexities and need, um, some tooling to really help out and manage out and orchestrate all that together. 
Absolutely. Uh, and admittedly, while this example may be only a single virtual machine, the process is scalable. Um, and as you can see from the dashboard, we've discovered the instance uh, as well as the net backup images that we can select from. And you're given an opportunity here to choose whichever one that you want. In this particular case, we're going to go ahead and just select the latest image that's available to us in, uh, in EC2. Uh, and we're going to click Restore. Now, the process that it's going through right now is quite extensive because there's, it's hard to believe, but there is an enormous number of steps involved in moving just a single virtual machine. So we're having to communicate with VMware to de actually shut down that virtual machine, uh, actually de uh, unregister it from uh, the ESX environment altogether. From there, we execute the restore process. And from here, you can see we've now switched over to the Net Backup Console, the web UI, um, at which point it will then in, uh, initiate the restoration process for that particular image. Um, that uh, will take a, a, a period of time in order to actually seed that virtual machine. Once that is then completed, we'll then go through the process of customizing that mm -hmm. VM specifically for the uh, for the EC2 environment. Mm -hmm. This includes assigning whatever you know uh, security groups, any particular um, IP customizations, and so on. Um, as you can see here right now, um, that particular image name has not been um, registered yet in the EC2 dashboard. Um, and as we go through the process of actually recovering it, um, you'll see that that eventually will um, form an AMI. That AMI will then be launched and then it'll be instantiated. Um, now, admittedly, some of this process does involve watching a little bit of paint dry. Uh, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to keep it too exciting when you're just looking at progress windows going through and, and ticking upwards. Um, but understand that the goal here is not to disavow the fact that there is a lot of complexities uh, in involved with doing these these operations, but rather making the process of automating them as simple as, as possible or as direct as possible. So all of the, the storage elements of it, uh, the network identification, the, the seeding of the particular instance, um, the, the particular image point in time you want to recover from. And then of course, um, this could be one, 10, 100 different virtual machines, all can be consolidated down into a single operation. And while it's being performed, the great thing about it is, is we are exceedingly verbose. Uh, in terms of the information provided to you. So at any point in time, we know precisely what's going on uh, in the environment. And as you can see now that that VM now has been instantiated inside of EC2, and we can see that that is now uh, finally available to you to be able to log in and, and access. Um, so while the, the process itself um, is, is straightforward in terms of what it's, it, it achieves. You're taking a virtual machine from on-prem and moving it to the public cloud. We recognize that there's a lot of steps. There's a lot of moving parts involved here. Um, in this particular example, we're using net backup, but there's actually a data mover included with VRP as well so that you could have workloads that get recovered to a much tighter RPO. Uh, you know, with uh, most net backup images, typically you're looking at on the order of every you know, 24 hours or so. So if you have a workload that, satisf that satisfies it, you're, you're good to go. Um, but if you've got ones that you want to recover or migrate to with a much tighter RPO, included with uh, the resiliency platform is the uh, same, um, uh, is a data mover as well that supports replication from VMware environments directly into EC2. Um, so as you can see now that uh, the process has completed and that particular VM has now been migrated from an on-premises uh, VMware ecosystem directly into, the, um, into uh, EC2. Joe, it all looks so seamless. Uh, it is so seamless. It is. I know, but is. I'm just, you know, I'm still fairly new at this. Is this something, is the resiliency platform a separate product or is this that, how does it, it, it looks like it's just tied right in with that backup. Well, that's the great thing about it is, is with as of NetBackup 8.3, as an end user of, of, of that product, you actually are given uh, entitlement to use the resiliency platform. So the ability to orchestrate the process of recovering those virtual machines, the ability to uh, integrate with um, uh, the, those different uh, MSDP images, as well as the data mover, as well as integration with our InfoScale estate as well, all is included with your entitlement now with NetBackup 8.3. Cool. Awesome. So with that, um, Henry, I want to thank you for uh, for uh, helping me, uh, you know, walk through this process. Um, just to sort of, uh, you know, to kind of close this out. I mean, you know, in, in your experience, you know, doing these kinds of procedures, how would you how would you say that uh, this process compares to a typical experience that a customer may have in terms of, you know, simplicity or just overall ease of use? 
Yeah, I think, um, and what you guys were just talking about is uh, kind of really, really powerful, Joe, especially with NetPack of 8.3 and tying all the kind of products together because NetPack of kind of handles, we have several different use cases that we see with partners and often it's a I mean, a journey that customers go through, right? So they go, they may start with, you know, backing up their data to uh, to the cloud as the kind of first step in the journey. And then they may say, okay, well, now I want to go and I want to do DR, right? So I want to take what I had and build on top of that. And then as they get more comfortable, they may start wanting to run workflows on there. And then they need to protect those workflows and also provide high availability for those workloads. So it, it, there's really, if customers have to work on that whole life cycle and that whole journey at the same time, trying to figure out what tools they're going to use and retrain their development teams and do all that. It, it, it adds a less extra level of complexity. This, you know, tying in together all those pieces really simplifies it and being able to use the same data set, you know, so you're already gaining the ability to do DR uh, functionally without having to replicate a whole new data set by being able to use uh, a net backup repository as a data mover for um, for um, uh, VRP. It's hugely powerful because it enables customers to go right from having their data on AWS to having their DR on AWS without a lot of additional retooling and rebacking up right. and re-replicating. Yeah, I mean, the refactoring, which is tends to be one of the things that seems elusive or a little bit daunting, it's all handled in, you know, uh, in band, right? So the process of taking that virtual environment in whatever format and then making it available directly in EC2. Awesome. Well, Henry, thanks for those insights. That's been tremendous. And thanks for, for, for partnering with on this portion, portion of the session. Uh, Beatrice, I'll hand it back to you for, for any Q&A that may have uh, queued up during the, uh, during the session. Uh, thank you so much, Joe and Rich and Henry for that great presentation and demo. So let's go over some questions actually that came through the chat. One of the question is, is the resiliency platform a not on product or is it part of a hardware appliance product? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, the, excuse me, the resiliency platform itself, while separate in terms of how it's installed and deployed, it's not part of any physical appliance. It's actually installed as virtual appliances um, with the entitlement tied directly to your net backup licensing. Um, so you would download and install um, virtual appliances for VMware or from the AWS marketplace directly to be able to instantiate those, uh, those instances running there. Oh, great. Thank you. Another question that came in through the chat, if you right size a server to the cloud, does that impact servers or apps that look for a certain amount of RAM or is that purely virtual on cloud provider? Um, I'll take that one. Yeah, go so, ahead. Yeah, so a lot of applications might tell you, even though our right sizing with an Aptar might tell you that you only need, you know, four CPUs and four gig of RAM instead of 16 CPU and 32 gigs of RAM. Um, you know, we, we're going to tell you the right size that it needs to be regardless of, of what you actually have to do. But in order to satisfy some uh, software requirements that you might have to actually provision what they tell you to. So there's nothing we can really do about that. But by and large, most of our customers, you know, they've got tens of thousands of uh, VMs that are on-prem. It's a, only really a small percentage of them that are really bound by those vendor uh, configuration settings. Yeah, those constraints, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Rich. And another question that came through, is it possible to consume Aptar reports using APIs? Uh, yes. So. Uh, that's really around the automation part of things. So a lot of what Aptar is doing can pre-fetch uh, the information that you're going to need. And then we could feed via our REST API any type of automation tool that you would want. So an example of that report that I showed earlier, if you wanted to get that list of VMs and what their right sizes would be, you could then prioritize them and then make a REST call. And it would then feed you that list of uh, guest names that could then be fed into uh, an automation script, which could then handle this uh, the migration automatically. So yeah, we've got a built-in REST API that can take all that data and then feed it to some automation. Oh, that's great. And one last question actually that came in, actually a couple more questions. Yeah, bring them. <laughs> Do you plan to build VRP containers to deploy on Flex? 
Oh, that's a very interesting question. So I was going to um, ask that myself. I'm I'm not going to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to overstate the roadmap for for those items, but I will say this: that um, uh, like uh, like Thanos, containers are inevitable, and uh, I would say that uh, most most strategies uh, will involve some form of containerization that way, so that the flex appliance could be used for that. Uh, how long or how far out that is, I I can't say, but that is absolutely being looked at for a number of different workloads, not just specifically the uh, virtual appliances for VRP. Right, thank you. One last question. On storage capacity, what type of insight does Aptar Analytics provide to customers planning cloud migrations? Well, what I was showing earlier was really focused around, you could see it was just memory and CPU, but obviously there's another aspect of that, what we're gathering from an on-prem VMware environment, which is, you know, we know the disk capacity of a VM. We also know how many IOPS that that VM is, is using. And we can map the VM all the way down to the spindle. So we know uh, what kind of storage it's actually using. We know the tier of storage that it's currently using. And we also know if that um, the LUN is maybe being replicated to another uh, offsite uh, uh, array. And so all of those components are going to be factored in or can be factored in when you're trying to plan a, a migration you don't want to get surprised and then move something to the cloud and then find out that you know you've got um you've got replication requirements and then that's going to incur additional ingress egress charges or even potentially uh moving data to another availability zone so we're going to give you all that information up front uh and we can do it fairly quickly and and fa in fact most of our customers that have vmware uh it, these are just new reports that they're running to be able to just take what they were doing with avatar before and just you know, using it for a different purpose. And to sort of kind of expand on that a little bit, one of the things that we are really keen on with our technologies is that if you look at the topology that you're using today on premises, be it VM or even physical, and taking advantage of things like storage array replication or any form of stretch type clustering, all of those concepts can be reproduced in the public cloud using Veritas solutions, right? Whether it's NetBackup, VRP, InfoScale, Aptar, we can essentially create that consistent experience for you so that you um, you don't sacrifice any resiliency whatsoever, but you gain all the benefits, right? All the flavor and none of the calories, I like to say sometimes. Um, so you can have a consistent sort of experience. Um, so your workloads will be resilient, they'll be performant, and they'll be protected. Hey, great, that was really amazing. And thank you so much for answering all those questions. I would like to take this time to thank you all for attending the session and your active engagement. To continue the conversation, please visit vrts.as slash nbu9 and join the NetBackup 9 user group for the latest blog posts and release updates. Have an amazing day. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Thanks.